I am pleased to welcome our first speaker, uh, who is um, Harry van Haren, right? Yep. The pronunciation. Yeah. And um, he will talk about integrating hardware controllers and audio software for live music. But I also want to take this opportunity to show another sponsor. Yeah. And um, I want to thank, uh, we want to thank um, Oliver Hanratz for his generous donation. Thank you. All right. My check one, two. You can hear me okay down the back? Fantastic. Good stuff. Um, hi, everybody. Harry Van Haren is my name. I'm a uh, kind of a, a music-y audio software developer person, um, interested in open source software, interested in using Linux for doing live performances, and I'm kind of known in the community as the, the OpenAV guy, I suppose. Um, so OpenAV is kind of a software entity trying to create music for live performance. Now, often I attend the Linux Audio Conference, and that's a slightly more technical, um, kind of academic, I suppose, um, scenario or environment. And I believe Nils was mentioning just there that this is a very music-focused um, environment. So I'm going to try and orient all of what I'm saying as much as I can towards the musicians and try and leave out all the technical detail. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in the technical detail. So if you do want to ask the nasty questions, please do. <laughs> But uh, realistically, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it as, uh, as music-focused as we can. So I'll talk maybe for two minutes, then I'll do a live demo on these two particular controllers that I have here in front of me. So I see lots of head moving down the back. Um, there are some chairs up here. If you want to switch up, then you can. If you want to actually come up here and kind of stand around and have a really close look, that's fine with me as well. Um, when we get to the demo, I'll kind of invite some people up and we can, we can see how it goes. Um, so what are we talking about today? Um, Quite often when we look at hardware and software, we think of the hardware is the thing in front of us, the software you know, does magic in the background, and we don't really think of the two as a single unit. And what I, like in, in a live performance environment, there's very little uh, space for error. You need to have very quick access to everything you want to be able to do. And what that means is that the hardware that you have in front of you, so these particular controllers in this case, are your interface to that software. And if the interface in, on the hardware is mapped well to the software, then you can have, as a, a combined workflow, you can have a very powerful workflow. So if you think of hardware and software not as two separate things, but you actually integrate them together into this one kind of logical thing that we can interact with while on stage, I think that's a very powerful and cool way to think about performing. If we think of it as, here's my hardware controller, and that's the software over there, then the fact that they're not integrated and they're not closely collaborating together to give you the best like possible options as a performer on stage, then, then we're losing some of the magic that could be happening if we really have good integration between hardware and software. So I, I kind of mentioned it as blurring hardware and software into this one thing. And that's to achieve a really powerful workflow for on-stage use. I've tried to set this up with a number of kind of different environments and free open source, free Libre open source software, and found it quite difficult to achieve in general um, to, to have something really tightly knit together. And that's kind of what I want to focus on today to, to try and show you how we, we can, as a community, and as a community of musicians, power users, and developers can try and improve that situation. So that's kind of the, the question that if you're thinking at any point, why is Harry telling me these things? Keep that question in mind. How can we as a community enable this tight integration between the hardware that you own as a musician and the software that developers write and the power users in between? So, so that's kind of the, the community. I'll talk more on that, but first uh, we'll jump into the live performance demo. This is the part that I... Uh, affectionately refer to as, who's a DJ? And the answer to that is, not me. But I do know what a DJ does, right? They press buttons and make music happen. So basically the idea is, um, I'll show you a little demo. Again, I'm not a DJ, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, what I have here are two controllers. They're two um, in, um, controllers that are not by default supported on the Linux platform. So if you plug it in, usually nothing happens, and unless you're a bit of a, a, a tech wizard and you either look at DMessage or LSUSB, you're not going to realize and you're not going to get any access to these controllers from your Alsa MIDI tab or something like this. So there is, um, first of all, there, there's a level of blocking that if you plug these things in, you don't get anything on the platform. 
And what we're trying to solve is to get these, these pieces of hardware integrated into a particular program so that you can actually do these things. Um, if you do want to see, feel free to stand up at the back or have a look. I've put a book under the back to try and tilt them towards you. If I tilt them much more, I can't see them myself. That won't do a good performance either. So uh, let's give this a go, but um, I will be around later with these controllers and I'm happy to share them out if people want to play with them and things like that. Cool. Um, here's what I'd done earlier. <laughs> So what I'd like to demonstrate is uh, a program called Mix. So many of you in the community are probably familiar with Mix. It's an uh, open source DJ software. It runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. It has a huge range of features and is actually a really, really nice piece of software. Um, the one thing that I found uh, that perhaps could be improved is support for more devices on Linux. So tightly integrating things like these controllers into that software. Um, that's what we're trying to achieve. I'll do the demo first and kind of talk through a couple of little things that I'll try to do, um, and then showcase where the tight integration kind of comes in. So first of all, uh, we have a crossfader on the fader. We have some volume knobs. I have some filters. I have some other buttons. These all pretty much interact exactly how you expect. So on a one-to-one -one point of view, this filter knob does what the filter knob should do. Great where's the innovation or where's the tight integration in there. It's when we bring it all together that it gets kind of cool. So I'm going to try and play some audio through the audio jack. Just heads up to the sound, guys. And uh, let's give that a go. And we should have something now fading in. There we go. All right, that's about half volume. Uh, yeah, that's good. Fantastic. All right. Um, this is a piece of music. It's kind of calm and nice. Now, what if we were to try and affect it a little bit? I have some uh, on, on a separate controller. I have some effects here. So these effects are going to actually integrate with the mix effects. You can see somewhere here, if I expand this little guy, you'll see what I'm doing. I don't expect you to understand everything here. I'm just trying to integrate or to demonstrate the integration between the hardware and the software. And then we'll talk more about that later. So if I press this particular button, there's a, a blue button there that's turning on and off my reverb for that, for example. So all of these buttons are mapped to mix functionality. There's nothing magic going on. It's just the, the controllers integrated with Mix. But you can do some cool things with that. So for example, I'll take the filter out and we'll add some reverb to this particular. Again, no, no effects with effects. There's a lot more echoes and things going on. So, Still, we're talking about one deck. OK, great, you can turn some effects on. That's really not that novel integration. It starts to get cooler if we bring in more tracks and start to do kind of cool crossfades or crazy things between tracks, where your hands become the limiting factor. It's about the number of buttons you push and how you can push them is where it becomes uh, that the tight integration is really required. So as I mentioned first, like a one-to-one -one mapping of a knob to a software button isn't really that interesting. Here we have a bit like, OK, I could tweak the amount of echo, the amount of reverb, and maybe there's some hot cue buttons here. So, so we could skip throughout the song. So let's give that a go. I'll fade in. All right, so we still have the effects on. We can high pass it. Now, let's bring in a different song, perhaps. Um, something that has a bit more bass in it, because I'm a bit of a bass junkie. So. totally go badly, right? But what did we, right, but what did we do there? So in, in, the, in the, the mix there, I suppose, um, <laughs> cheers. I'm, I'm not a DJ. <laughs> um, so, 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 so what did we actually have going on there? And, and I'll talk through how many different buttons I pushed there and what actual effects they all had. So we started off with uh, this particular tune. We had a lot of effects and things running on it. I kind of high pass filtered it so that we got this very uh, kind of like ambient thing. But under it, what we brought in was another track, which sounded like that. 
Now, that has a bunch of reverb on it and a very low-pass filter, so without the filter it sounds like this. And without the reverb it sounds like this. So we can shape this sound a huge amount by actually low-pass filtering, by doing a bunch of effects on the fly. And the fact that we're doing it on the fly, and uh, I have a loop set over four bars just so that we can kind of contain the sonic material to keep it easier to mix in my mind. I, I know that the only thing that's happening on that right deck is just the bass. And then I brought in a bit crusher. That's this guy. So it kind of distorted the whole sound. And then as we came out of the mix back into the original song, uh, I took away the bit crushing and faded across so that the other song was gone. So the, the blending there of all these different components at the same time when you kind of tweak the echo and the reverb and things in the middle mean that it's the hardware integration that enabled me to do that. With a mouse or even keyboard shortcuts, I just it, you wouldn't have the control. You wouldn't have it fast enough. So step one there of, of what I'm trying to showcase is that um, integrating, doing tight integration between hardware and software pays off. It allows you to do cool new things. Um, that might have been like, yeah, duh, Harry, we all knew that. Fantastic. In that case, you're not the audience I was talking to just yet. <laughs> um, but really, that's what we're trying to get to, right? That, that we have these workflows where, with a piece of hardware, we can do cool new stuff that wouldn't be possible beforehand if we didn't have that really tightly knit together um, hardware and software. I'll skip back to my slides for a second and say, before I even jump into this, I, I might leave this screen up for a second. You see how many buttons there are up here. We've seen, uh, I've used these two quite a bit. I've used a few of the second effects chain. I haven't used effects chain three or four at all. I haven't used a whole bunch of other mix functionality that's there. That's just my workflow. It's the way I think about DJing and what I do in this scenario. But each user, each musician here in the audience probably has their own way that they'd like to map those controls. They'd say, no, no, Harry, when you use that filter, you should have done something else. And I would have mapped a different button to that same physical knob. And that's where the complexity comes in. So each of these hardware mappings is really tailored to the musician. So that when you're a musician on stage, you're not thinking, what did Harry tell me that button does again? That you think, I remember what that button does because I told it to do that. Or I was involved in the process of mapping this device to some piece of software so I know exactly what everything does. The nice thing for me being I map these in a way that I think is logical for me. So if I stand here and I'm a little bit nervous, my hands are shaking and I press a button, in my head, I know what that button does because you're involved over a longer period of time in creating that and in ensuring that it does what you want it to do. So the uniqueness of this hardware to software is what I'm trying to, to pinpoint. That as a musician, you have your own requirements, your own uh, desired workflow, and that means your own integration between this hardware and software. So as a community, we need to somehow facilitate that each musician has their own requirements in this domain. And that um, if we don't allow that to easily be achieved by the musician, we're really limiting the musician in the end. That the software, even if the software is absolutely awesome, if the hardware doesn't uh, integrate well with it in the way that the musician desires, we're still missing the, missing the bullseye, in my opinion. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the community, because ultimately, um, so um, Nils mentioned that there's a kind of a Linux audio scene. Um, I'm, I'm one of the Linux audio users, I suppose. So I say Linux audio here, really I mean free and open source software or even just generally software people. Um, in, in the Linux audio community scene, uh, I think it's fair to kind of group people into three blurry kind of groups. We have users that are people who are primarily interested in using software. It doesn't mean they don't have technical skills or that they're not a power user in a different domain perhaps, but in this particular domain, they're interested as a user. There's power users that are people who are like, look, I'm technical, I understand the inner workings of bits of this, and I can also do, like, I, but, but primarily they're still using the software, so they are a power user. Um, and then there's developers, and developers kind of get their own section over here, they write the code, they look at the features, they look at functionality, and write code. There's nothing to say that a member can't be all three of these as well, but um, for the sake of this argument, I'll split it into three groups. Um, right now, um, what, or yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump straight into the question. This is the question I'm trying to ask. Who does the tight integration of hardware and software? And I don't see anyone raising their hands straight away being like, ooh, I know the answer, and, and my answer is this, nobody. Nobody does it, because right now it's, it's just, it's too, blurry. There's this, these three components in the community, and I think end users would love to have it. Power users would love to be involved and be able to, to create this stuff, and developers are like, yeah, that'd be nice, but who's going to actually do it, right? 
right now that's nobody. And, and I kind of looked at it being a, primarily a developer type myself. I looked at it from a developer's point of view first. And I asked myself, like, why? Why doesn't this exist already? And one thing is perhaps developer priorities. Maybe the developer just isn't interested in on-stage live workflows. So they don't have the experience. They don't have the, the drive to, to enable this. That could be. The second is time. You can't possibly help every musician in the community on a one-to-one -one basis to achieve their mapping to your software. Even if you have the basics of MIDI mapping or something like that, it's often still complicated to, to really tightly integrate. And I draw a line here between MIDI mapping, like basic input, so that like, hey, this dial now turns that one dial on the screen, and what I'm going to call tight integration. With tight integration, I mean, if I press this button here, the rest of the functionality of the buttons on the device changes. So you actually have not one controller, but one controller with multiple levels of mappings. And that allows you, instead of me having to reach for this play button, I actually have a second play button by using a shift mode. And that allows you to, to really get creative with how the controllers work. If you don't want to drag around a controller for every function, and you end up with one of these you know, massive mixing desks from a studio for your live performance, if you want to use two small little devices, you have to do this multiplexing or multi-layering of controls to hardware. And that's something that's really difficult to do, both in software and in terms of setting it up as a musician, as a user. So the time to help people and the complexity involved in it is kind of one of the, the reasons that I thought maybe that's, that's a blocker. And the third one is you need access to the hardware. So I can't help a user who has a, a piece of hardware X that I've never heard of, that I've never held in my hands, and I don't know what it does. So it's just almost impossible to try and help that user because the hardware, like they, they plug it in and they say, yeah, it's not working. And I have no way to test if the next code I write will work or not. And to push it to the user and say, hey, test this, and then they say, no, it's still not working. That, that's such a terrible development workflow, it's just not going to scale. So there's three things that I see. One is, is the developer even interested? The second is, can the developer like, reasonably help people who are trying to achieve this tight integration? Um, keeping in mind that there's usually lots more users than developers, so that's like a one-to-many for the developer point of view. And the last one is the access to hardware. Okay. This is the most technical part of the talk. Um, I'm going to still skip over all the technical details, but um, it's, it's about code. So heads up. Um, controller library is something that OpenAV has been working on. It's a library for controllers, believe it or not. Um, what I'm trying to achieve is this tight integration. So we're trying to answer the question that I had earlier, who's going to do this? And from a community point of view, who's going to, to enable this um, tight integration? And that's what this controller library has been designed for. If it's achieving it or not, I'll leave up to everyone else. But uh, I'll talk you through three of the main things that controller library lets you do. And then I can showcase a little bit about Mix and how that's been working. So first of all, virtual devices. I mentioned in the previous slide that access to hardware is required, right? So if I don't have the hardware, I can't program for it, or I can't even assist a user in debugging an issue. They say, hey, when I press this button, it does something else than you told me it would do. I say, OK, maybe, but if I don't have the hardware, I can't even test it. So as a developer, you just can't help people. So the first thing that the controller library tries to solve is this access to the hardware. Now, because we can't get access to the hardware itself, the controller library solves this through this concept called a virtual device, which is literally, if you take this device and popped it onto the screen, that's what your virtual device is in controller. So each knob will turn up as a knob on the screen in the software interface. Each slider turns up as a slider. And what we try to do with that is to enable the developer to actually assist users in debugging because they now have access to a virtual version of the same hardware. So because you have access to some part of what the user has, hopefully we can actually achieve a bit of um, yeah, debugging and helping of the users. Second, mappings and scripting. So just because you have access to the hardware still doesn't mean that it's going to do everything you want it to do. You still need to do some mapping and scripting. I'll talk about that in a sec. After all of this, why does the musician care? And what I'll show next is um, hopefully why a musician cares about this type of, yeah, this controller library and what it can achieve for us as a community in achieving this tight integration. So uh, this is also the most um, error-prone part of the talk, I suppose. There's a, a couple of technical things here that I'm going to be throwing around. So you can ignore uh, bits of what I'm about to do if you're not interested in technology. That's fine. Um, so I have these two little lines for the people who are interested in the technology. I'll talk through them just because I have to run them anyway. We're exporting two environment variables. They're called controller virtual vendor and virtual device. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, I'll change this for a second just so I can demonstrate too. Uh, I can talk to you later. I think that's probably a better plan. <laughs> um, it, it, it's setting two particular environment variables. I, ca I can't easily enlarge the font, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so what we're doing is we're going to, basically I've instructed the controller library to take this piece of hardware and to make a virtual version of it for me as a developer. So I'm going to leave this on the table over here. So you can see that I'm not cheating. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to run mix pretty much the exact same as we did before, just from the command line, but with these two uh, environment variables exported. And the difference is going to be now that we have this guy on the screen. Now, I don't know how accurate you guys can see this particular piece of hardware controller, but it's, uh, it's close enough, right? We have two LED bars here. They're the two blue bars. We have some buttons. And we have two dials missing. These two dials are actually analog dials, so they don't get sent to the computer. They are just contained within the device because it also has a sound card, so they don't show up on the device because you can't actually map them. So apart from that, um, yeah, the dials uh, move. So as a developer, if I want to test this, I move this dial. Now, for the people who have been paying very good attention, you'll see that the filter dial in the Mix UI actually moves as well. The reason it does that is because Mix believes this hardware is plugged in. From Mix's point of view, this hardware is actually active. But from the controller library point of view, it said, yeah, yeah, I'm telling it it's active, but really I've just made a software version of it so that this developer can do some testing. Um, the cool thing there for me is that what we've solved is one of the three big blockers um, that a developer cannot assist a, a musician in debugging a problem. Well, now we can. So that's one of the, the uh, kind of party pieces of um, the virtual devices, I suppose. I'm going to do that again, this time with a different controller, just to show you that um, this is the other controller I have here. Um, again, it looks roughly like this. And if I press the button over here, what we'll see is that the state of this device becomes pretty much identical to the one here, the physical version, right? So if I press this button, the button in the controller virtual interface also turns off. If I press this button, the button also turns off in the virtual interface. So we can see that it's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping, the virtual version and the <laughs> the virtual version and the physical version are corresponding one-to-one, -one, and they're both interacting with the actual mix program behind it. So again, what we're trying to do is solve this barrier between a developer not having access to hardware and the musician having hardware, and there's no way for them to work together on solving a problem. I hope that this virtual interface actually solves that problem for the developer, and hence we as a community can kind of move on towards doing, yeah, cooler stuff. Um, if I take a track now, I'll, I'll just showcase one or two of the f like fancy features, I suppose, of this mapping. Um, I loaded a track into the left deck. You'll see that these buttons lit up on the left-hand side. And similarly, on the hardware controller, we have the same buttons and the same colors. So certain of these LEDs can do red, green, and blue, like the, the four there. Others can't. So this Q button on the bottom left is always blue. And the uh, virtual device will reflect those same capabilities. So what we end up with is if we um, actually start yeah, using this, that the hardware stays exactly in sync with the virtual version and should at all times reflect it perfectly. That means that as a developer, I can write uh, a, a, a one of these tight integration scripts from Mix to the virtual version, and when the user plugs in the physical version, it should behave identically. That's the goal that we're going after. So if I press play on here, we'll see play is only green, play is green there. The hot cue buttons, on the other hand, are yellow, purple, kind of turquoise, and green. So the, the actions and the feedback from the device are both exactly the same. And it's the fact that the feedback is the exact same is actually the, the biggest value, I think, because that's the hardest part to debug. It's input mappings to a piece of software has quite often been solved with MIDI mapping and things like this. It's the output that's the tricky bit. It's getting the state from the piece of software back to your piece of hardware. That's the hardest part. Uh, yes? Um, it does not have motorized faders. If it did, then I would have to basically, when, when writing the support, the controller support for this device, also state that these are feedback devices as well as input devices. So right now, um, I can demonstrate that actually, if I change, uh, let's have a look, this dial, I think, it doesn't change on the hardware, 
But if I move this dial, it does change in mix. So, so that indicates that th this dial here on the hardware is like I can move it physically, but it can't move itself. So exactly what you said. If, if that was the case, then we'd have to allow for that, and, and that's very possible. Um, it's actually quite similar to how the buttons would respond. So um, very good question, though, absolutely. And if there's more questions, feel free. Uh, I'll keep an eye on time. Uh, yes? Is uh, Mix actually offering already an API that you are using to, to send the movement of the rocks, or did you uh, start with the idea of very good technical question. I will answer it anyway. Um, Mix has a lot of infrastructure for this stuff. Uh, the guys at Mix already have a kind of a JavaScript API thing that you can use to do controller bindings. So this is not particularly news to the Mix project. The exact implementation with which this was done uses something called the control or control objects inside Mix. So I'm not using this JavaScript library. This is all C code, and that's for uh, a very explicit reason, which is the scripts that I use to run from Mix to the virtual device and from Mix to the physical devices is actually C code. So uh, I, I won't go into the details here. If you're interested, please do ask later. Um, the reason that we're doing that is it allows to compile it into the program later and do all kinds of cool things. Um, Long story short, Mix has a lot of infrastructure for these kind of things, but what I'm doing with the controller library, or trying to do anyway, is achieve that we implement the support for the device once, and then we do a mapping from the device to the software. What that means is if the, con excuse me, if the controller library supports a device, then we can plug it into a different piece of software, for example, either Loop, one of the OpenAV projects, or some other application that also integrated this controller library, that the same device support is already there. The, the, the issue with the, the current, or in my opinion, the issue with the, the current mix approach is they bind directly from the hardware into the mix software. And there's no way that that work that's been done to support that piece of hardware can be translated to another application. So if you want to add support for this piece of hardware to a different application, you have to do all of it again. And I, I'm, I'm kind of putting one layer of mapping in between that so that we as a community, once one developer has enabled a, a piece of hardware, anybody else should be able to profit from, from the, the work that that developer done in terms of adding support for hardware. That's the, the goal there. So with this virtual device, I hope that I've kind of demonstrated the value of, okay, why do you as musicians care about this controller library thing that I keep talking about? Um, it should enable us as a community to work more effectively together in terms of getting tight integration between the hardware that you as a musician own and the hardware that I as a hardware or as a developer have access to. And this is kind of a bridge in between those two. So enabling the community is really what, what I'm trying to achieve with this, so that we get to a situation where developers code features or code hardware into the controller library. The power users write these scripts. So I, I mentioned earlier that there's a, a bunch of power users, people who are technically very familiar with the software. They're perhaps not super active in writing code, but they are very active in the community. And I, I see the power users here as being a, a key to supporting musicians and people being like, hey, I have this mapping issue. What could we do? As, as a noob user, I rock up and I say, hey, I, I have this particular piece of hardware. Can I map this? And then I think that the, the power user is the ideal person because they have the musician's point of view, but they have the experience or some of the experience with developer, with the, the technical aspects of the project. And if the power user isn't able to achieve what they're doing, they just refer directly to the developer and say, hey, look, I think I found a bug here, or I've found an issue that I found hard to solve. What's going on? And can you look at it as well? And hopefully with this virtual device infrastructure, the developer can actually emulate the hardware itself. So uh, a plug back to the CCC guys and uh, these hackerspaces and these kind of events. This is typically where there's lots of power users. And as a noob user, if you rock up and say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in mapping this controller to this particular piece of software, but I need some help, I don't think I'm technically aware or capable enough to do it myself, then someone who has maybe a bit of you know, Google Foo or some, some general bash scripting experience could probably achieve some basic mappings with you. So it's about leveraging all parts of our community. It's a part about not looking at one part of the, the problem, which is kind of what I said earlier, right? Who does the tight integration, as in what individual person does it? And I kind of cheated and said nobody, but really what I mean is we as a community should look at this problem and we as a community should try and solve this um, so that developers can code the features, the power users can help in this tight integration from the hardware directly up to 
the software that the developers worked on and that as a musician you have a friendly kind of environment with power users and with support as required to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Um, at this point what I was going to do is basically ask for feedback suggestions on how are we doing, what, what do you think of this idea as a community, do you think this could work? Do you think no way developers are far too stubborn and never get anything done? Do we think power users aren't power power -y enough? A question, yeah. I actually have a question. Uh, ah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Uh, my question is, where uh, does the um, virtual controller come from? Who's building it? Is is it a, a thing already standard, or you, that the companies will? Um, give to, to, to all, all the people? Good question, very good question even. Um, so slightly technical answer. Um, the controller or the, the virtual device gets built by the controller library. So what does that actually mean? For the application, it's transparent. They don't know like at an application level if it's uh, coming from the hardware or from the virtual device. Um, where does the device actually come from? It actually reuses a lot of the infrastructure that's used to support a device in the first place. So, for example, this device doesn't actually support, or nat like native support for this doesn't exist on Linux. If you plug it in, nothing happens. So some piece of software is going to have to go and read the, the bytes from the cable and understand what that means. So that's what I call the driver behind a controller. So the controller driver is what maps the, the, like the hardware events. So if I turn the knob, it sends some events that maps those events to what I call controller events, which are generic. And the application just understands these events. What we do in, in terms of the virtual device is I've taken a ruler and I've measured all of these things <laughs> physically from this device and put them into some code. And then I point a, a different function, which is a, a kind of a user toolkit called AVTKA, uh, not the same as the AVTK that some people might be familiar with. This is version two. Um, which basically builds the user interface of that that you saw earlier with the, the lights flashing and everything else. It builds that interface based on the description of the hardware that it gets from this driver. So uh, would it be possible for, for example, if you have a musician bought a new controller and he's um, st um, struggling with it and now he, he needs to create this virtual controller, would it be possible for him to download a piece of software and send all the data you need to, to create it? Good good questions. Um, I do see some scope in that. Actually, there's been one instance where a, a user got in contact with me and said, hey, I have this, it's a really awesome, massive DJ controller. And they said, I want to, to, to help map, map this thing. And I said, sure, I don't have access to the hardware, but we can do it the hard way, which is basically, he has to measure something or set, you know record some piece of, here, I'm moving the filter knob send me that data, I look at it and I go, okay, those things have changed. Uh, that means it's uh, blah, 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 blah. And we figure it out. It, it's long and tedious, that's possible. Um, slightly better way of going about that, I think, would be probably to record all of the events, like, okay, press the filter on button, press the mode button, press the other filter on button, to record all of those in a sequence. And then the developer basically has a, a you know an absolute huge amount of data and then needs to dig through it. Now, ultimately, you, you hit a really good point, which is, a developer somewhere needs to enable a device, a device being something like this. So it, it, it doesn't solve the problem for everyone, and, and I'm not claiming that it does. I hope it's a step in the right direction. If a user has some piece of hardware that the controller library just isn't aware of, it's not going to work. That goes for devices like these. So this being a USB HID weird device. If we have, however, something like this, this is a standard MIDI device. This has a generic backend. So if I plug this in and we wanted to go map it, it should be possible. And that's possible through kind of a generic API. There's no virtual device for it, but the MIDI mapping of these devices is quite significantly simpler than mapping of the others. So um, including feedback. So the feedback to this device should also be possible in the current state of the controller library. Um, it's something that I hacked just together last week, so it is relatively fresh, but it should be working. <laughs> I see there's a question down the Mac, Nils. Uh, maybe if you want to bring the microphone down, yeah. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll say that it's not extensively tested, but in my experience, it worked quite well, including uh, doing things like mapping different colors or sending kind of custom MIDI commands to the device. Not sysx, but yes, note on, note off, cc change, those kind of things. Um,
yeah, I'll take the question at the back. So I might have missed this in the beginning, but how does the controller library talk to the software? Can Could the library also act as a gateway to some piece of hardware that understands, for example, open sound control? Good question. Um, ultimately, the current way that the software and the controller library interface is through uh, a bunch of C API calls. This is getting very technical, I'm aware, but hey, I was asked. I'm sorry, Nils. <laughs> well, I'm, um, I'm mostly interested in the second oh, part of the question. Right, Can it act as a gateway to, to OSC or something like that? Um, right now, the controller library itself is not uh, some kind of OSC to OSC mapping interface thing. Um, in theory, that could be supported. Um, realistically, I'd see it more as um, and so kind of kind of similar to the like there's a MIDI generic backend to allow all MIDI devices be controller devices. I kind of see a similar approach where we could have an OSC generic backend and then the user defines the the tags or you know the URLs and uh, the particular parameters it takes and what feedback to send based on that and then to, to build something up there. So do I see OSC being supported at some point? Absolutely yes. Um, is there value there? I think absolutely there's a value. Um, I'm, I'm curious still as to exactly what the use case is why, when you mention gateway. I, I, don't, I don't think I understand that as a question, but let's talk later maybe otherwise and, and we'll do the detailed stuff. I think there's another question back there and then we'll get to you, Johannes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have a very technical question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Uh, because I asked you last time on LAC about the generic media support and it's good that you mention it because I see it in a way that Applications can forget about uh, implementing normal MIDI for receiving and outputting. Like um, in my application, I use RT MIDI, and I suppose with uh, Controller, I can forget about that library and use Controller directly because it reads MIDI devices, it outputs to MIDI devices, and other stuff as well. So, actually, three questions. First is, can you handle notes uh, at the moment? So. So if, if we're going to do the technical talk, we need to have a, a clear distinction between two things. One is that a MIDI device works with the controller library. That just means that the controller library can understand the MIDI messages, right? That doesn't mean that the controller events that the application sees are actually MIDI type events. So I like there's a, a concept of a button in controller. If I press a button, it sends a button event. Um, in MIDI, we have things called note on and off events. I map those to button events. So the application needs to understand what, that there, there are multiple buttons on this particular controller. You could have each key on a keyboard be an individual button, for example. So it, it, there's, a, there's a slight transpose is what I'm trying to say. That, and it's not like I supported MIDI, MIDI natively and just pushed it up to the application and said, hey, here's a MIDI device, deal with a stream of MIDI bytes. It is actually controller events that the application sees. So there is an abstraction. Does that but, answer it? Yeah, kind of. It's... So it would work. That's related to my second question, because then we can use MIDI mappings like hardware uses uh, IDF files, I think, so that you have the list of MIDI messages possible and you actually only show those ones that your uh, MIDI keyboard actually sends and receives. In, in that way, then controller will see like this is knob one, knob two, and a bunch of buttons instead of generic, generic CC messages. Right, yeah, a MIDI NAM type thing is what you're talking about, right? The MIDI NAM files. I haven't looked into it. Uh, in theory, there's probably improvements we could make there, yes. Okay, because if you get that, I'm happy to um, get away from RT MIDI and implement control instead. Well, let's see. That would be nice. Was there a third question? or The third question is about user permissions. Yes. Because you know you run as root in your yes, computer. Yes, I do. <laughs> Um, do you need UDEV files or yes. other stuff? Okay. Yes. To so the idea there is when you install either an application that has um, controller support or you install the controller library itself, it also sets up your UDEV rules so that you get access to the hardware that controller supports. Um, again, I have very little experience with this. Don't need it. I'm root. Um, but yes, that is something that was brought up at the LAC and uh, there is a, a tag somewhere in the GitHub uh, issues that, that shows how we should be doing this. And th th there's a lot of things left to do. Um, there's always more to do. This is one of them. Uh, absolutely. Good question. Thanks. Uh, I hope not too technical. It somehow refers to, uh, to a question uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, so uh, 
once there's OSC available in the controller library, so uh, it could also be used to uh, to uh, to map to any software that supports OSC, like Ardour. So uh, if if I want to uh, to make the controller library available in Ardour, it's uh, I have the choice or uh, either to hack uh, OSC support to controller library or controller library support to Ardour. But one of those has, has to be done. Optionally. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. No, uh, agreed. Uh, if, if the ultimate goal is to enable all of these hardware controllers on all of the software that we have available in the, the open source ecosystem, then absolutely yes. Um, if OSC support is, is like, if there's two questions out of a group of 50, I guess there's demand for it. I'm not personally a user of OSC much. Um, I just find, I don't know, I, it doesn't fit my workflow or something. Um, but if, if there's two users that are requesting it, I'm happy to look at it this evening and maybe we have it merged for tomorrow. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> well, that's the way this works, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, I have like two questions. Uh, one, could controller be and the virtual devices be used to um, try out devices before you buy them, for example? They can. Um, so, so as you saw, I just ran two lines of code and then started the application that I wanted to test as normal. Um, there is a, a, a mapping script file between this particular device and the software. So those three components are required. You have your virtual device, some kind of mapping file, and the software itself. Um, with that, you can click on the, the, the virtual interface and you can control essentially everything. I would argue you're not seeing the benefit of owning the device because with this device I can, you know, twiddle a knob here and move a fader and press that button all at the same time. Try doing that with a mouse. So do you lose something because you don't have the physical device in front of you? Yeah, but um, that kind of dovetails into the next question, which are actually two. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm just having a picture that we could have a community developing virtual devices and that we would need some graphical tool to design the virtual devices. And that some people might, you know, measure the controllers and lay out the buttons and the knobs. Some other guy could, uh, like, plug the device in and make the, the design program learn the virtual controls from the physical. So you don't have to have a stream of bytes and you dig in with hex editor. You just do MIDI learn or like learn control, like, okay, I want to learn this knob. I move it on the physical one, it's on. Oh no, it learned the other way. Okay, say, tell it to flip the, the, the polarity or something. And other people could like, I don't know, make, maybe make images, take pictures of the controllers or design some beautiful UIs if they want. Like there are many people could contribute to creating a great library of virtual devices for testing before you buy and for creating these mappings. Yes, um, very good question or idea and indeed, so, so ultimately what do I see as future plans for the controller library I think is, is kind of aligned with that, right? What's next? Where do we go from here? Um, what I think would be absolutely awesome, and this is total pipe dream, right? Um, hardware support, hardware vendors, so people who build physical controllers, implement the actual code required into the controller library and as part of that actually support this virtual device format. So the really nice thing about doing this virtual device format is actually um, the API that's provided, you can pull out all the strings that are on the device. So if I want to see what does this particular button actually, like what's its name, there is an API there. You can pull the name of it because all that information is provided by the backend. So similarly, all the button locations are provided by the backend. If a hardware vendor was to provide this, which is pretty much zero effort compared to the effort required to actually develop a, a commercial piece of hardware like this, um, I think that there's a lot of value there if we can get enough support for controller library that we can twist kind of the arms of manufacturers into doing this. Um, it's kind of a catch-22 situation that like, I can support X amount of devices, all the devices that I have at home, I'm working on supporting them. We have generic MIDI, we have another few. Um, but to, to really enable the community, we need more people who build the hardware itself to get involved. And that, that's kind of, I think, what you're getting towards. Like we, either you need to reduce it so that any power user or user can twiddle the knobs themselves and add support for this device. I'd love it if that were possible. I'm technically not a machine learning genius, so that's not going to happen on, on my watch, I don't think. I would like to see it happen. I, I'm not sure um, how, how feasible that is. 
Um, the other part you were asking is designing UIs and things. Currently, I, I see Control Lab as being slightly more scientific than, hey, let's design this awesome UI with loads of pretty pictures. I see it slightly more as the, the actual UI itself is built up without any pictures, just with coordinates and measurements. And that gives us the flexibility that if some, um, if, if, if another piece of software comes along and says, hey, I don't like the way you're presenting those virtual devices, they can implement their own virtual device, like, you know, info to on screen implementation. So they can represent those devices in different ways or color them in different ways or use a different UI toolkit. It all doesn't matter because the actual punchline is the, their measurements and scientific coordinates from the device. So there's some benefit, I think, to having that. That said, if someone creates some awesome graphics and says, here, Harry, pull request, merge this, I don't... Gigabyte file. Not that. <laughs> um, no, but you see where I'm coming from, I think. Um, so yeah, there's another question there somewhere. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, so this is very non-technical question. Good, great, <laughs> the first. <laughs> uh, if I understand what, what you're doing now is that you have to start, uh, you have to type your two commands just to say to mix two interface with your uh, devices, right? Um, but for the, for the, the, the user that is not a poor user or, you know, the, just end user. <clears throat> uh, how does how will this fit in the traditional Linux audio ecosystem with Jack and whatnot? So for the for the ones who are used to just you know go through Jack and connect the MIDI so stuff together. To, to summarize your question is what does this look like or what does a controller and yeah, piece how, of how will this look like to a user? Yeah, exactly. How will the user eventually use yeah. this I, I since can, it's not MIDI? So I can show you. It's easier. Cool. Um, I'm going to go to zero, that's here. I have a little terminal. Okay, you, you users don't use terminals, I get that. I'm yeah. just showing this as I launch <laughs> applications from a terminal. This could also be a desktop icon. I don't have desktop icons, I can't demonstrate it, sorry. Um, what you do is basically, if you, if you click your, your, your start button, uh, what's it called? Uh, the button in the bottom left, and go through your menu, and you click uh -huh. on mix, it ultimately does the same as I'm about to do in my terminal. And it will start, and in the back end of mix, it initializes a controller context and it connects to any devices that are available. Okay, so Mix has to be in this integrated case, with controller. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and that's something that I've been working on, including that we have here the that, um, okay. actual controller instance in the Mix preferences pane. And we can see that its name is Native Instruments Control X1 Mark II. The author of this particular backend was me and blah, blah, blah. So I, I am still working on enabling this interface to make it easier. Also, there's a scripts tab here that I hope to reuse that if you have multiple mappings for one controller to mix, that you can actually choose which mapping you want. So it, it also means that uh, developers have to put the work into integrating controller themselves yes. in their software. Currently, right. yes, absolutely. There was a question earlier on OSC support for Ardor, yeah. and that kind of ties in with that. If if there's another format or another communication method that controller and whatever application you want can use, like OSC, for example, then that's another way to solve that problem. Right now, to get the best tight integration, I think just like linking to the C library, as in making you know code changes, is is the best way to to ensure really really good tight integration. But uh, there, there's options there, and there's always options, right? So I, I'm not set in my ways in that the controller library has to be used in this specific way. I'm just saying right now, this is the way it seems to be the most useful to me. Um, in terms of actually yeah, using this controller library from an application, I've integrated it in, into Mix. I've integrated it into Loop, so that's one of the OpenAV looping uh, audio software projects. I've worked on a couple of other smaller kind of demo applications that I haven't really released, but I can show a video of one in a while that's a, a very, um, I suppose, high-tech or kind of modern DJ application, which also drives the screen on a controller. So one thing that I didn't mention is like there are bigger, chunkier controllers that have high-resolution screens and things like this on them, and they are actually all enabled by controller as well. So I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a second. I'll take another question or two, keep an eye on time, and then, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm just digging deeper into the OSC and integrating with different software because uh, Zenat SubFX is currently driven with OSC. Like you can do anything. Yes. The, the whole preset of the synthesizer, which is huge, is put in through OSC. So if controller supported OSC, you could 
map a physical controller to a virtual synthesizer one to one or have these multiple layers like go through all your eight uh, voices in AdSynth and different engines and like do crazy stuff live. Yep. Which would be awesome. Yep. Thanks. So, uh, <laughs> who's coding OSC support this evening? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> uh, so, so what I'll do is I'd, I'd, I'd actually uh, partially forgotten about the fact that I have a video to show you guys as well. Um, it's, uh, okay, heads up for sound for the sound guys. <laughs> Um, I'll just stop it here and talk a little bit in case we kind of miss what's going on. This is uh, the software making the noises and running the lights and the screen is a pretty much controller sample application. So it uses the control APIs, it uses Cairo, uh, a well-known kind of thing to render graphics, and then pushes all of the graphics and the buttons and the state of the LEDs down to the device while in the background it's running a jack callback to actually do the audio processing. So it's a relatively typical Linux audio kind of program. But what I'd like to look at is the integration between the screen and the buttons and the lights. Keep in mind there is no user interface for this. It is just what's available on the controller itself. But the punchline is there's three hot cues on the screen there, there's three hot cues lit up, the actual lights are flashing in time with the audio in these, these lower light LEDs. I turn off the edit button, the waveform changes, and if I scroll a little bit we can change the speed of the waveform. So these are all kind of like advanced features that as a user you might want to change these things while you're performing. Whereas in a studio setting, those things just don't really make sense. You don't need that level of tight integration between hardware and software. Whereas here, I think the value is exactly that. Um, that, that, that tight integration that the, the device you're working with is giving you the interface to do your music creation. So uh, I see there's another question. That's also the end of that video pretty much. So, or the end of the interesting part. Ooh, hot cues. <laughs> Sorry again for yes. stealing the show. Uh, uh, so that it looked like mix running on this little controller. Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's Except amazing, it, dude. It, it, it's not a little controller. It's about this size, and it's also not mix. But yes, it, it is. A, it's a DJ style application. Um, for those slightly more technical, I'll skip back to this bit. Um, you see these four faders. There's a, a, a music format called Stems, where you actually export four tracks: one with drums, one with synths, one with vocals, and one with some effects, or something like that. Um, what I demonstrate right at the start is that those four tracks are actually being sent to the four uh, faders so that you can individually take out the, the drums or the bass or things like this. So you can do some cool things with that kind of stems focused mixing. And that, that's what I was trying to enable actually here. You see there's four waveforms at the bottom. They're actually each individual stem being plotted out. So when, when people say like, okay, what's it like to integrate controller into a piece of software? It really depends on how much integration do you want. In this case, the application has to understand the waveforms that it uses, like inside the software, deep inside the software, there's these waveforms, or the audio data rather, the waveforms will need to be generated and then pushed out to a device like this if you want that level of integration. And that's difficult. It's not easy. And I don't see it as getting super easy either, but I do see it as getting turning into a possibility, which is something that we previously didn't have in the, the free open source community in, from, from my point of view. So the nice thing there being that we do have some kind of library and some kind of infrastructure to start enabling us to achieve this level of integration with hopefully any piece of software or, or, or such. Um, I'll jump back to this slide. I think that's, yeah, that is my last slide. Um, so at this point, we can plug in more controllers. I can try and showcase more things that Mix is capable of. Ultimately, I, th I think, yeah, the value really I, I hope to have shown you is that as a community, if I jump back to this slide, what we're trying to do or what, what I'm trying to achieve with the controller library and with all of this tech stuff that we've been talking about is getting these type of devices to be more useful to us on stage and to, to enable these kind of faster live workflows. Um, how do I do it? I ha if I have a device, how do I reach you? And um, or, or you or some other person who um, can enable this uh, this work. Um, me, I'm here, 
you can come over and talk to me. That's probably the easiest. Over here. Yes, you, you, you all, but uh, right. us all, but also the people um, on the live stream. The recording, maybe. Cool. Later. Um, so the easiest thing to do is probably to either go to the controller GitHub page. This assumes you're kind of technical and interested in, in GitHub and where code is hosted. Um, OpenAV Productions forward slash controller is the, the name. Otherwise, go to the OpenAV website, openavproductions.com, and there's a, a link there for controller things. Yeah, we um, have a minute. Show it. Show it. OK, <laughs> fantastic. Um, one second. Wait for my laptop to catch up. And da da, the OpenAV website. So yeah, if you scroll down a touch, there's a um, email there. Uh, that's my email. So yeah, it, just get in contact. The other option being uh, GitHub on the controller page. Uh, the URL is there, but this is generally what it looks like. If you Google for something like this, then you'll definitely get the right repository. Um, send me a message, whatever. Even feature requests, things like hey. I want to test this particular MIDI device. I don't even know where to start. So inside the controller source code, this is getting super technical again, but please I do. Have, yeah, yeah, please I do. have two minutes. So. <laughs> um, so when you run the actual uh, controller source code and you compile it, we get this bunch of different uh, little applications. I usually advise people start with the simple one. Um, what does it do if you run it? It'll print out anything that happens. So if I twist this thing, it says encoder rotate. If I m move this other one, it says encoder rotate left. If I move this guy, it says FX1 knob left. And over on the, the left column, it displays how many percent it's turned. So I guess you guys can't really see that. Now it's at 100, and now it's at zero. So you can see if I press buttons, the buttons rock up. Um, in the same way, I ran the, an argument with the simple, if I run number 10, the light that's being lit up is going to change. That's a tiny little light there. If I run, I think, 16, then... Anyway, you get the idea. There's an application there that lets you to basically test the um, device itself. There's also a different uh, little binary that we can run to test the devices. So if I want to test is this all actually doing what it should be doing, then we can see on the virtual interface that's generated here as a device test interface. Similarly, if I click the buttons, the lights on the physical device light up. So you can see it's pretty much a one-to-one, -one, like the, the physical hardware and the virtual device are, are linked to test if that link is correct. I think there's a question down the back. Yeah, I guess the final question. Um, those waveforms that you're drawing uh, on the device, are those also possible in the virtual devices at the moment? So right now, the virtual devices don't support screens yet. Um, it is something that I've worked on. I haven't figured out exactly how I want to expose the pixel arrays to an application. So there's a bit of work left to do there. Very good question. Ultimately, yes, absolutely, it is the idea to do that. Um, I don't know on the technical details just yet what the best way is to do that. Yeah. Good question. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope it wasn't too technical, and I hope that the musicians kind of found something to, to keep them going as well. Um, Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.